Hello, welcome back to Char Reads. Today I'm going to be talking about Brit-ish by F. Wa Hirsch. Um, F. Wa, this was published last year. F. Wa Hirsch is a 38-year-old lawyer-cum-journalist um, from London and her dad is British and her mother is from Ghana. A lot of British is about her trying to do justice to the African parts of her heritage and identity and struggling to fit between those two worlds. But it's also about what it's like to be black or mixed race in Britain and how that intersects with class and there's also a lot of historical context in the book. I have to admit I really got off on the wrong foot with it. Um, I struggle when books that are kind of non-fictional about a subject start by being very autobiographical because I think it's like you haven't given me a reason to care about your story yet. Um, but also, so Efwa is uh, a very, very privileged woman. She grew up in Wimbledon, which is a very affluent suburb of London. She went to private school. Um, she had very supportive parents. She studied philosophy, politics and economics at Oxford and basically has every gift that could be given to her besides like being white and being a man. <laughs> and then she starts talking about this guy Sam who she met in Westminster at a like lawyer event um, when she just finished university and uh, she totally buries the lead on the fact that they are married and have a child now which is like a weird way of phrasing it but anyway so Sam is uh, both of his parents are Ghanaian as well um, and he grew up in Tottenham which is a much kind of like more I was gonna say urban. Tottenham is just like a rougher neighbourhood in North London there is a like it's there are more black people there there is more poverty there and um yeah sam had a very like fractious um upbringing and you know was very like materially deprived and within 10 pages she has the hubris to say like you may be like materially like deprived but i had identity poverty she doesn't use it as that word but he says like in, in terms of identity i had a silver spoon i just don't think you can compare like growing up in a white neighborhood as a mixed race girl like i cannot i don't think you compare the struggle of that to being like uh, literally in poverty and and very downtrodden because of like structural racism mm. if i'm going to read a book about the struggles of black people in britain i kind of want it to be written from the perspective of someone that i think has really struggled with being black in britain in like a systematic way not in a personal struggles with identity way. She definitely had her hardships, but I just don't think they're comparable to someone that didn't have extremely supportive parents and a like private education and plenty of money. On the back of this book, there's a quote by Dolly Alderton, who I've mentioned on this channel before, not a big fan of. Um, and when I saw that, I was like, oh, this is part of that like Guardian reading 20 and 30 somethings, like self-congratulatory writing world. And similarly to Dolly Alderton in Everything I Know About Love, she seems to act as if her like individual struggles with something is, is a thing that everybody else should be experiencing to the same degree and that's something that really bothered me there is a bit though where i think i think it's sam who says like you know you have the privilege of, of being able to worry about your cultural identity because you don't have anything else to worry about so this isn't the kind of book that i would actively read. Um, I read it for a book club which was really great um, but I think I already absorbed a lot of the content in it from talking to black friends and um, you know reading and listening to content from other like black and mixed race people. Stuff like interacting with police like you're way more likely to be stopped and searched if you are not white and about having to code switch to fit into like the white professional class society um, and you know feeling torn between uh, like straddling those two cultures so I feel like I had to kind of glaze by some of that because it's stuff I already really really know um, but there were a couple things here that I found really interesting two parts I want to highlight in particular the first one is a section for bodies very incongruously to the rest of the book um, she opens one chapter in a sex club and it's a sex club um, in like random town uh, in the UK where it's all about black men and objectifying um, and sexualizing the, the black male form and she really highlights that like the myth of black guys have giant dicks is about subjugating them to an animal and being really animalistic and there's this whole aura around black bodies of exoticism and and sexualization um, which is like really 
pervasive around black bodies in a way it's not around white bodies. And that's something I never really thought about the exoticism of it. I never really thought the whole like big black dick thing was racist because I pictured it as a, <laughs> I didn't picture it, you know what I mean. Um, to me, it's like, that's like a biological fact. They have larger than average penis sizes. Um, but I think the way that's like interpreted in society to being something that should be objectified um, is interesting and something I hadn't thought about before. The other thing she talks a lot about is the slave trade, which is undeniably forcing black people into a white society on the lowest rung. And she was talking about how we have to confront the fact that we were material in making all of that happen. Like we caused the slave trade, um, but also being conscious of the fact that even when it was abolished and we abolished it, we still left, like that still left blacks on the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder and how there's, that's, it's gonna, it's, it's hard to, to flatten that out when you, started at the bottom. What's not contested is that when Britain did abolish the slave trade, the value of the 800,000 or so slaves still owned by the Brits in the Caribbean was valued at 47 million pounds. Of this sum, the 20 million pounds so cheerfully stumped up by the British taxpayer after decades of black agitation was not paid to compensate slaves for their abuse, loss of family, income, dignity, blah, blah, blah. The remaining 27 million pounds was paid for by none other than the slaves themselves. This is something I wasn't aware of. I, I like most, I guess like the average Brit coming into this, which is the thing that she's trying to make you confront, is we think, oh, we abolished the slave trade, we're good. I mean, like we probably, you know, made it happen, but like we, we fixed it. But actually um, all of that money that the like taxpayer gave over went to the slave owners to be compensated for their loss and not to the people who had been, you know, forced to work in an, on another continent um, for however many years. And they had to continue working in slave-like conditions to pay back their slave owners for releasing them, which is crazy. And it also goes into the fact that it wasn't even, it wasn't like the goodness of our hearts that made us think, oh, let's not have slaves anymore. Like there was a kind of political um, and economic reason for it also making sense to abolish the slave trade. And I've never thought that it was that cynical. I assumed, because I've never like, learnt about this in history. To be fair, I did quit history as early as possible, <laughs> like when I was 13 or something. Um, but I think the narrative, uh, the like common narrative is that we all recognise that this, that slaves are humans and shouldn't be treated like shit. Let's collectively decide to abolish that practice. But realistically, it was so much more commodified than that. Um, and that's kind of horrible. It's horrible. It's kind of the, the trouble of being a monarchist, ardent monarchist, um, means you're expected to have, I think people like perceive that you have a, a patriotism and a, um, a appreciation of, of imperial rule, but that's complete bullshit. Like I, can, I, I genuinely think the queen is a great thing for this country, but I really ardently disagree with a lot of things in this country's past. And I do think we did we have done amazing things. That should never be taught above some of the horrific parts of this country's history um, that really should be taught a lot more widely. Um, you know, it's, it's good to have a little national shame, isn't it? National shame is probably better for us than national pride. So that is it on my discussion of British by Afwa Hirsch. Um, I did enjoy it a lot. I think, it, I think it was really informative and it was well written. I personally didn't enjoy the more, um, introspective identity struggles aspects of it, the autobiographical aspects, um, felt a bit gratuitous. But I think overall it's, um, to, to anyone there's at least some eye-opening in it. Yes. Let me know if you've read it and enjoyed it and I look forward to chatting in the comments below.